Hey, what's happening, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 579. Today, Andrew Adams is back, and we're joined by Sergeant Jason Hamilton as we continue to explore the subject of appropriate use of force. It's an interesting conversation, and we go deep. It's, this is some good stuff. If you at all enjoyed the last one that we did, or even if you didn't, if you missed it, whatever, stick around. We've got some good stuff for you. Now, who am I? I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, and I love the traditional martial arts. And so we get into all kinds of good stuff around the traditional arts. And in fact, Whistlekick, that's what we're dedicated to doing, getting into stuff for the traditional arts. That includes everything from content like this, to products, to services, you name it, we're doing it or we're looking to do it. So go to Whistlekick.com, check out everything that's happening, maybe find something in the store that floats your boat, use the code PODCAST15, and you get some cool new shirt or hat or whatever it is, and we get some money to cover the expenses on all the things that we're doing. If you want to check out more about this podcast, we've got a snazzy, shiny website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where you're going to find every single episode we've ever done. Yes, all of them are available for free. And we bring you videos and links and photos and transcripts and all kinds of good stuff to help you get the most out of each and every episode. Two episodes every week with the goal of connecting, educating, and entertaining you, the traditional martial artists of the world. If you want to help us out, you can make a purchase, like I said. You can also share episodes or tell people about our mission, or you could support our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. We post stuff up there several times a month. And depending on how much you're willing to throw our way, we're going to give you more and more stuff back. Check it out. Now, back on episode 567, Andrew and I responded to a listener question about appropriate use of force and how it can vary depending on who you are and the circumstances. And Andrew and I, we did some exploration on that. But we both agreed there was the opportunity to go deeper if we could find someone who knew more about the subject from a legal perspective. Now, of course, there are plenty of professions that might have some expertise on this subject. We've had people on the show before who are experts on this subject. But we reached out, rather, Andrew reached out, had someone in his circle who is a Vermont law enforcement officer and also a martial artist. That gave us the opportunity to ask some questions, to learn some things, and you get to come along for the ride. So check it out, enjoy, and I hope you'll learn something. And welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Jeremy, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing great, Andrew. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Uh, we, I was uh, re-listening to a recent episode that we did, uh, episode 567 on the appropriate use of force, and realized that I know it was appropriate, considering we have a guest today who uh, I thought might be able to help us expand on some of that discussion. I'm excited. Yeah. Uh, after listening, uh, no, I, I realized that I had a good friend of mine, uh, Sergeant Jason Hamilton, who is a, a sergeant in a munis municipal, municipal police department in Vermont. hard word. Municipality. That is. Oh, a lot man. of syllables. That's rough. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I've known Jason for, uh, for a few years now. Um, you know, he has a, a background in Shorinru Karate, as I do. Uh, and uh, also being a police officer, I thought it would be um, a good idea to bring him on and, and kind of expand on our discussion we had uh, a few weeks ago. You should welcome him. Yes, I should. He's here. Jason. He's here right now. Sergeant Hamilton, welcome to Whistlecake Martial Arts Radio. Thanks, guys. This is wonderful. Thanks for, thanks for being on. Thanks for making the time. Uh, no, 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 not at all. Um, I, I got a chance to listen to the podcast um, after you pointed out that you guys were doing this and uh yeah i gotta say i was um you said uh somewhere up front that hey this is not law this is just logic we're just trying to be sort of reasonable assessors of this stuff um uh, but i think you guys how do we do got all the way around it um hey all right and that's the end thanks for joining us we'll see <laughs> you tomorrow <laughs> um i think i can help you expand a little bit um and sort of drill down on some things, but uh, I think for those interested in this topic, you guys you guys did uh, a good uh, a good treatment of it. That's good. I mean, at least we got something somewhat right. That's good to hear. That's reasonable. So I'm I'm curious. We're, 
Yeah, it was reasonable. Um, I'm curious, were there things in particular that you heard that were like, oh, yeah, okay, that someone as a police officer, I suspect, think of things differently than those of us that are not involved in that line of work. And was there anything in there that you specifically wanted to touch upon? Uh, well, there's a bunch of things um, that I specifically wanted to touch upon. The things that uh, you guys did a really good job with, I thought, even though you didn't know the particular words or phrases that we use for these things, um, you did a very good job staying vague. I guess uh, that doesn't sound quite as uh, as cool as I'd like it to. Uh, uh, not being specific or um, uh, not being uh, rule bound in your approach, um, letting everybody walk themselves through all of the um, the particular individual contents of every situation and uh, not getting bogged down in if this, then that, if there's a this, then there should be a that kind of mechanical sort of analysis, which is uh, just generally incorrect. And I think several times you guys sounded as though you were tempted to, um, and it's it's a very tempting thing. It's, you know, everybody that went through any use of force training with police always really wanted. I really wanted to, despite my martial arts background, when at the academy, I really wanted a, a kind of tit for that tat, if this, then that kind of um, almost algorithmic kind of approach uh, to deciding whether or not these things were okay. Uh, and it's, you completely cannot do that. The other thing that you guys did uh, that I thought was really good was you all, you either said or danced around in every mention uh, or sort of in, in every situation you analyze this idea of reasonableness and reasonableness is the key legal factor when uh, determining whether or not a use of force I, I use that terminology because that's the terminology we use as police um, um, or uh, a use of force was appropriate or self-defense was appropriate so um, to expand a little bit upon that, I got a bunch of notes here. Um, most, so most of the laws and the jury instructions, the other place that this is found uh, the most commonly, um, they include some sort of phrase. And I just, I pulled one that I thought was fairly representative. It says, you may use the minimum level of force that you reasonably believe is necessary to safely resolve the situation. So a lot of our a lot of our explicit self-defense laws and the jury instructions when self-defense is at issue use that phrase. Um, so you used the word reasonable a lot, high props for that. Um, for both and I think that was an accident. Uh it sounded like I, it. I, I don't I don't think that that Andrew and I, I mean, maybe Andrew knew more than I did. And I was just following his, no, he's shaking his head. No, no, no. I think that we just, I, I think in our efforts to be uh, nuanced and not overstep our bounds. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's the way courts, juries, and law enforcement, as we're doing our jobs, treat it as well. Um, the standard for, uh, for these things starts with the word reasonable. So, um, it's essentially what is what would be considered reasonable by a peer of yours. So for me, it's a police officer. Um, well, for me, in my my private life, if I happen to be defending myself or somebody else in my private life, it's going to be a reasonable citizen. Uh, for me, in my in my job, it's what a reason what a a police officer thinks. In my job, as I was explaining to you guys before offline. Um, one of the jobs of a, of a sergeant is to review uh, uses of force by other officers. If I wasn't in particular involved in that situation, but whatever it was, then their reports about the force that they needed to use in order to uh, complete their task uh, comes to me and I review a, a report written by them about what they did and why they did it. And then I review their 
uh, we view their body camera footage a lot and any other video that's available and any other evidence that's been collected um, and decide whether or not I think it was reasonable. That's sort of the main uh, grounds that uh, a use of force is going to be judged on legally. Uh, under under what circumstances are you reviewing these? I would imagine you're not reviewing every interaction that every officer in your department has with every individual. So there's some kind of threshold when, that triggers that. When force is used, uh, our general standard is, uh, I mean, it gets a little bit technical, but uh, anything uh, beyond compliant handcuffing, where we tell someone that they're going in handcuffs and then they do the things that we're telling them to do in order to be put into handcuffs, uh, essentially that's the line. So if you're telling people to do stuff and they're going into handcuffs and they're not doing the things that you're telling them to, uh, some level of being physically coercive now comes into play. Uh, and sense. even if that's, you're going to do what I say, or I'm going to tase you, you're going to do what I say, or I'm going to spray you. Uh, even when we've all, when we've altered someone's behavior, using a tool when the tool hasn't actually been physically applied, no one's been caused pain, uh, those situations all get use of force reports. I'm reviewing a use of force report now where an officer was giving instructions that weren't being listened to and pulled out his baton and uh, made his, uh, his instructions a little bit more assertive and it changed the person's behavior, but because he used this tool, this threat of force to change the person's behavior, that invokes this uh, process of reviewing the force that they used. I, 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 I want to jump on some real real quick and make sure that I'm, I'm understanding it because I think it's it's important. You're talking about that by by your definition within your departments, mm -hmm. your department, simply de pulling out a baton, not necessarily striking with it, but just its deployment is considered use of force along that, let's call it a spectrum. Yeah, uh, essentially. If I pull out my baton and make it known that I'm using it, like I, I take out my baton and hide it behind my back fairly regularly when I'm concerned that someone may escalate to a point where force needs to be used. They may become assaultive or physically resistant to a level that requires that. Um, I tend to be prepared for that sort of thing, but um, if I keep it if I keep it concealed and don't use it to change their behavior, then no. But click as long as they can see it and then uh, it's used to alter their behavior, use an attempt to alter their behavior. Yes. Okay. Anyway, that's um, nice. So it's important to remember. We're going back to reasonableness here. Um, it's important to remember that 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 idea of reasonableness applies repeatedly throughout these situations. The first, we must reasonably believe that force is going to be used against us or others. We can't just imagine because that guy has a mean looking face or she's bigger than me uh, or I saw her, someone who looks like her in an MMA fight the other week that's not, it's not reasonable then to believe that they're going to use force against you or somebody else. And imagining some far off distant future where uh, that person is going to become vigilante and killing baby Hitler, this is also not acceptable. It has to be reasonable and immediate. So they must have taken some steps right then and there that let us know that they are going to use violence against us or somebody else. And that could be either verbal or physical, correct? Verbal, physical, through action or inaction. Hmm. So someone's in your house. They're not welcome in your house. Hey, you're not welcome here. I don't know what you're doing inside my house. Them breaking into your house in the first place is a pretty big clue that, you know, things are not going particularly well already in this situation. They're refusing to leave. Right through inaction, they're demonstrating that force is going to be used in order to remove them. It's going to be necessary. Um, so 
we must also reasonably believe that the force in question poses a threat, right? It's, it's all well and good to say, well, I know that this five-year-old is going to use force against me. It is not then reasonable that I use uh, a, a, an overwhelming level of physical, physical force to stop the five-year-old from doing this. I can't now. It, it's not, it's not binary. The moment that me. the moment the five-year-old is believed to be about to apply force, you don't get to use any and all force at your means. That's where the word reasonable comes back in. Exactly. So, um, and then sort of a, uh, adjacent to that, uh, but also very important and important in a number of other places, we must use a reasonable amount of force, both for our own safety and for the level of the crime we're trying to suppress. It is not true that you may only use force to stop violence. I guess, I mean, we end up there because the amount of force that we're going to use to stop someone from grabbing our wallet out of our back pocket or pulling our purse off of our shoulders or um, get in our car and drive away is going to be significantly less. The amount of reasonable force in that situation is going to be significantly less. That doesn't mean that uh, we have to allow ourselves to be victims of these things necessarily. Now, uh, this is one of those places that uh, gets at sort of the fringes of my knowledge. Um, I've done some background on other states, as you said, up front, I work in Vermont, um, it's where I'm most comfortable, uh, but uh, there are some, there are various doctrines, we've all heard of the Castle Doctrine um, and duty re to retreat states um, that can change some of the stuff. It can, can you talk be... about those two things? Okay. Um, Not everybody may be familiar with, with, with those two those two concepts. All right. Well, um, I have a couple of things. Uh, I apologize if I'm forcing you out of order. If, if I'm asking these questions and you're covering them further in your outline, just tell me to stop and uh, you'll uh, tell me later. We're definitely totally going back to this stuff. Um, oh, okay. So that, that's fine. Okay. All right. Um, I just wanted to make sure that people didn't think that... Uh, universally I can run out and bust someone in the head if I see them trying to jump in my car on my driveway. Uh, that isn't a universal thing. Um, there, there are states and legal situations in which it is acceptable to use a, an amount of force in that situation. Again, it has to be reasonable for, uh, reasonable for the situation, the crime you're trying to suppress. Yeah, and I think it's important to note that we aren't in this podcast thinking that anything that's said here is relevant to every single person, no matter where they live. We have, you know, you may be living in the UK, which has completely different set of laws on this type of thing. So, you know, it's important to note that we are speaking with you and your your knowledge and expertise is in Vermont. So mm -hmm. I think that's important. That's part of it. I think so. Some of what I'm going to talk about is going to be broadly applicable in the United States because the court rulings and I'll, I'll I'll go over some of them. Um, they're, they're federal court rulings, so essentially every state of the union uh, sort of falls in line somewhere under that. Um, how each legal system accesses those things can be a little bit different, but um, yeah, but beyond the United States, now we're getting into something that is well, well, well beyond my bailiwick, and um, uh, I would uh, suggest some caution with that. <laughs> um, in general, uh, to sort of continue on this theme, in general, um, U.S. courts recognize that the force that someone uses in self-defense, the force that officers use uh, in defending the public and accomplishing our legal tasks, uh, uh, the courts recognize that frequently in order to overcome force on the outside, the force that we use must be greater than that. So... Uh, I mean, it, it again defies mechanical, if this then that, logical stuff. But um, sure. 
Rec- but I think anybody who trains gets that concept. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, whether we're, we're, we're working through because yeah, you're, you're, you're on as an officer, but you're also on as a martial artist, because you know, this is a martial arts show. And I think about if I'm training self-defense scenarios or I'm sparring or I just have somebody at, you know, before class, a friend of mine just goofing off with me. If they're going to, you know, let's say they come at me with a force of a, a four, me responding with a two doesn't really do anything. Mm-hmm. It's not It's not enough. There has to be, I would imagine, not only in appro- you know, the appropriate, reasonable use of force, but the belief that there's more beyond that. Mm-hmm. Yes. Otherwise, what's going to get them to stop? Yes. Um, and that's another one that I, I want to circle back around to because it's, it's sort of okay. part of our part of our police training um, and might be a little bit too specific to that uh, for a more general audience. But um, most people beyond sort of the martial arts world, even I think some martial artists haven't really come to this concept where in a self-defense situation, the survival situation, we must use force that is greater than the force we're trying to overcome. We're not in the business of sparring. This is an MMA match. This fight's not going to be stopped. There aren't any rules. There's not competitors who've been matched up by size, strength, and skill um, who are trying to determine who is stronger, had better training, has better strategy. You know, um, it's not a machismo thing. We're not, there's no, there's no ego attached to this. We're just trying to be safe when confronted with dangerous situations. Um, so uh, it was it was Angela that originally brought this question to you, Adam, Major? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was Angela. Yeah, uh, compliments to her. Uh, she has uh, touched upon something that I think uh, most people kind of forget. Um, and it's, maybe not the most PC thing to talk about, but uh, all of the factors that you bring up around her potential uses of force are, um, are, are important and they're looked at in uh, determining whether or not self-defense and the amount of force that we use in self-defense is reasonable. Um, So most of the jury instructions that I've seen and laws in particular, uh, as well, uh, previous court rulings have uh, suggested a non-exhaustive list of factors that you can consider in determining whether or not a particular use of force was reasonable. So weapons, number, size, strength, stamina, gender, training, injury, exhaustion, in terms of factors of the people that are involved, right? So I'll go over that again. Are there weapons? Are people wielding weapons? What is the number of people? Do I have someone helping me? Do they have someone helping them or more than one person? Are they larger or smaller? Are they stronger or weaker? What do we know about stamina? Am I exhausted from chasing them down? Uh, Am I exhausted because I just had a really good workout or just got out of two hours in the dojo? Um, Am I injured in some way? Are they injured in some way? Uh, uh, What's their gender? What do I know about their level of training, my level of training? Some people, we sort of know we have this information from them going back. Um, There are environmental factors. What's the surface? What's the lighting? What's the space like? Are there weapons available even if no one has already picked up and started using them? Right? Mm. There's a lot here. Yeah. Yeah. And that's stuff we didn't we didn't think of when we did our initial podcast. Um there's also some other things, right? So special status tends to rapidly evolving situation, which is maybe a little bit more of a police thing, but I think I think it still applies. Um Specifically in Graham v. Connor, which is the big uh, court ruling that brought in the police reasonableness standard into uh, the the judicial system, 
um, courts recognized that frequently when officers are choosing to use force, um, choosing whether or not to use force, they're making split second decisions in tense situations in which we have less than a second to figure out what the right thing to do here is. Um, so, and I mean, there's no way that that is not true in a self-defense context. Um, so you guys did a, a very good job, I think, with this. Um, you said it explicitly, like this, we're not standing and analyzing. All right, so I punched him once. <laughs> The world would be much simpler if we could do that, if we could, you know, press the pause button and, and think about, you know, I, I didn't count, but it sounded like you had roughly a dozen factors there to consider. Yes. And that's, that's overwhelming. Yes. It's a tremendous amount of information. I, I know, I know, I know the majority of people in training when I, when I've participated or, or run drills that require adrenaline coming up, most people make the wrong choice the first i don't know 100 times thousand times but right? it takes a long time and i i i'm glad i've never had to make a decision that has had to be scrutinized um it's tough it's all tough um but remember when looking at these things, when I'm reviewing use of force for my officers, when I am determining whether or not someone used self-defense on scene when you know, someone might be arrested here for assault, um, we understand and it's sort of protected in the law that folks are making split-second decisions with thousands and thousands and thousands of potential factors. Um, I don't want people to get bogged down in like, I know this list of factors and I need to consider each and every one of them. Uh, Sensei Donahue, very, very fond of making fun of the idea that, you know, the martial artist st standing in front of their assailant opens up their book of techniques and, okay, <laughs> so it's, we, got, we got a hook punch with the left hand aimed at the right side of my face and I have to, it was the, the Hong Kong Fui cartoon, Sensei Donahue would talk yep. about constantly um i don't i don't think that folks are going to be mechanistically again counting their way through all of these factors your sense of what is going on on scene is going to include these things already and how whether or not something is justified is going to involve taking those things into, into consideration. So if you're explaining what you did after the fact to the police who show up, for example, um, this factor, this factor, this factor, this factor, all of those things are gonna come into play and maybe we ought to be ready to talk about them. And consider them. Yeah. Uh, should be noted that uh, all reasonableness is an in the moment reasonableness this is important what is it okay, okay what does that mean there's no benefit of 2020 hindsight that is to say if someone is making deadly threats and is reaching for something in their waistband we do not get to go back after the fact and say well the person was reaching for their waistband for their phone so that their friend could come pick them up and bring them to the ice cream stand. That's not the way that this works. It is what is known to the person at that moment, that specific moment. So to, to say it an, a, another way, because this, you know, and let's, let's not go the political route that we could. Let's not follow this down the rabbit hole that I'm sure listeners know where I'm going and I'm not even going to say the words because you know where this could lead. We don't get to arm Monday morning armchair quarterback. We have to continue. If we're going to look back on a situation, we don't get to introduce any new information to that bubble. It exists in that moment in time fixed as to what was known then and any additional information um, while it may 
be relevant to other things is not relevant to the determination of appropriate amount of force. Right. So it's nice. Um, yeah. I mean, I think we should, should avoid the political discussion just because, I mean, I'd be happy to have it just uh, maybe. I would not. It, 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 <laughs> we, it, we work really hard to keep politics out of this show okay. because it's everywhere else. Okay. Um, but so determining whether or not a person was reasonable in defending themselves and using the amount of force that they did to defend themselves, we need to put ourselves in their shoes at that moment. We cannot look back with 2020 hindsight and say, well, this person was actually just a crazy person uh, who didn't even know that they were there and was talking to themselves and None of that stuff uh, matters, really. Because we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have known that in the moment. We wouldn't have known that in the moment. We did not know that in the moment. If we didn't, if we did, we're expected to take it into consideration. So um, in my list of factors here, things like special status. Um, is the person, uh, does the person have some mental health issues? Something that we could consider if that's something that we knew. Uh, all right. So I've got a feeling this might derail or come back up later. So kick it down the, the line if need be. What about you should have known? Um, you should have known is uh, is is a thing. Uh, it, it is it is possible that one would make that argument that goes to the uh, the reasonableness um, uh, of. I'm sorry, the reasonable of, of uh, the, our amount of force um, and reasonably believing that force is going to be used against us, right? So let's say we're, we got someone reaching for something in the waistband. Mm -hmm. If we know after the fact that that thing wasn't a gun and we believed at the time that it was a gun, it is going to be questioned, should you have known that that wasn't a gun based on its placement, its size, its shape, its other characteristics? Um, and could legitimately become a question that damns self-defense uh, if it was, if we have very solid evidence that you should have known that that wasn't. Now, uh, there's a lot of things that can muddy those waters. Um, and uh, police in particular are trained on a lot of things uh, that, that very specifically muddy those waters. Uh, we've definitely seen, I, mean, I don't wanna get too, too deep into that one particular example, but it is a question that could come up okay. provided that there's, there's evidence for it. And no, that wasn't gonna come back up later in what I was saying, so thank you for asking. Of course. Um, I want to come back to this later. So um, in my experience, in most cases, uh, the police are the ones that are going to make a determination of whether or not someone was defending themselves. We're going to make a determination about whether or not self-defense was relevant to the case at all. If two people are fighting, we're going to be determining whether or not some one of them was defending themselves and we're going to arrest the other one if that's what we think. Usually... The, the process of, of including self-defense in the uh, criminal justice, sort of the whole criminal justice flow from there on out, starts with the police and frequently it ends with the police. Um, and I have uh, numerous cases that I was involved in as an arresting officer, as someone helping somebody, um, where that was the case. Um, so uh, I would say in general, my experience of these things, and this is again, not gonna be universal, um, but most people who on the face of things are acting in good faith to defend themselves or others are never charged. 
that can go in that can go the other way. I know um, if deadly force is used, even if we think that uh, it seems like it was used in self-defense, uh, we're significantly more cautious and we're already consulting with prosecutors to because they're the ones that are eventually going to be prosecuting or not prosecuting these things. So we're including them in our decision-making process. And um, there's an abundance of caution uh, in terms of on-scene judgments when it comes to that stuff. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in one of my cases here. Um, but uh, many, many times I have had situations in which on the face of it seems like so-and-so was just trying to defend themselves. And that person never gets arrested, never gets charged, never really gets looked at again. Their name comes up in the affidavit of me charging the other person as a witness. And that's just about it. Um, but don't assume that police are going to trust your account of what happened. I can't say this enough. You know you're an honest person. You know you're a good person you know that you are going to try to represent things as they happened. You're not gonna make yourself seem like a superhero. You're not going to cover up the things that you think might have, you might have done better, uh, uh, any of this other sorts of stuff. You're not just simply going to lie. You know that you're going to do that. I have no idea, none. And people lie to me all the time. People lie to the police. That's um, almost like death and taxes. It is an absolute fact of, of where we are in the world. And there is nothing written on your face that determines for me that you are the person that's telling you the truth and the other person, the person who's lying. So I start with the assumption that what everyone tells me is at least a little bit wrong. And in fact, even if your intention is to be completely honest and upfront, it is your perspective that you're telling me you about, which means it's not, you know, it's not the all-knowing third-party view of what happened. It's it's yours, it's subjective, and it's on scene. Um, we when we when we do any investigation, essentially, it always starts with talking to a person and getting an account of something that happened, we're always searching for information uh, to support or refute what people have told us. When you are thinking about whether or not a particular act of self-defense is going to be justified now, we're looking around for other sources of information, be they other people, be they video cameras, be they physical evidence that shows that one account is more uh, or closer married to the truth than another. Um, we're looking for other elements that we can alight on, other pieces of information that can confirm or deny what someone is telling us. Um, so to go over a couple of cases, uh, these are two, the two that I immediately come, that immediately came to mind uh, as I was thinking about this were um, just because they were just kind of interesting from this perspective. Um, uh, I was dispatched to a report that someone had been stabbed at, uh, at the time, one of our local drug houses. Um, and I got there and we had everybody separated and we had a, a whole spate of cops there. Uh, the uh, uh, We had some folks from a neighboring agency who were already in town and they showed up and helped us and we sort of got everything ordered. There was someone actually stabbed. Uh, he was taken to the hospital pretty immediately and everything else sort of turned out peaceful when we could kind of separate folks out and make sort of a safe space for everyone to be uh, interviewed and, and everything to be looked at. The story that I eventually get from um, the man who stabbed this guy that went to the hospital is that the, folk, the fellow that went to the hospital tried to push his way into his house. He said, no, 
there was sort of a battle over the door. Who gets the door? Um, do I get to come inside your house because I know that there's a, a drug dealer in there and I want to buy my drugs from him? No, you don't. It's my house. I'm saying no. That turns into some fisticuffs. The man who was stabbed pulls out a knife. Knife gets knocked to the ground. According to our stabber, uh, he's losing. He's getting pushed over uh, back railing. This fight is now ensuing out on a deck. Uh, there's a very, very, very large drop off of the back of this deck, and he thinks he's going to fall to his death. He eventually gets his hands on the knife and uh, sticks him, sticks the guy in the side. Um, I tried to talk with the stabby. Um, the stabby was really, really, really high and just kind of couldn't give me a great breakdown of, of what had happened here. I got some statements from some other people that were mostly corroborated that that's generally what happened. The two of them started fighting. I don't really know what it was about. Uh, the drug dealer himself was, of course, not going to tell me anything at all about anything. Nothing happened. I don't know. That's just I, people, things. I, who, who knows? I don't care. Um, in the end, um, getting what I could get out of it, uh, there wasn't any cameras that really covered it. I, I really wanted there used to be a camera right back there uh, that, that no longer worked or didn't work at the time. Um, and after consulting with the state's attorneys, um, we, the person who was trying to break into the house was my, what we call a primary aggressor. So the person who is choosing into this fight. Um, and that's the person we would have arrested but we were also going to charge, and we did charge uh, the other fella, the stabber, uh, who we determined was probably mostly defending themselves, or at least um, based on the majority of our evidence was defending himself. Um, uh, we didn't end up arresting the stabby, the one who was not defending himself and brought the knife, um, because he was stabbed and he needed to be in the hospital. And so we issued them both citations, we charged them. And um, I don't even know exactly what happened uh, in court with it, um, but I thought that example, interesting to see that these circumstances can kind of evolve, that uh, we are trying to determine who is defending themselves based on very incomplete, very vague evidence from a lot of people that are going to lie to us and physical circumstantial evidence that only somewhat, only corroborates that actually something happened and not who was in the right. Not the details. Not, not the individual details. Hey, video is great when you can get it, but. Uh, so this one's interesting to me because of the the there's so many factors right there's so, there's so many things going on and and i think it might be easy for someone listening to say oh well you know whether or not they were the person going to buy drugs or they were the person who if, if i understood what you were saying correctly the person who was in the home was harboring someone selling drugs you know they're both in the wrong so it doesn't matter uh ship them both off to jail but it, it doesn't it doesn't work that way we don't get to do that no um uh certainly in situations where there's been physical violence uh my attention to whether or not uh there was also drugs is is, is very very low um violence drugs like violence very 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 important it's like it's the the, the most important job drugs some people make bad decisions about things to do with their life uh, I can't make good decisions for them when this is present. We're not we're not super concerned about that. Um, not that it's been a factor, and it's part of the story. But um, I did not arrest anyone for possession that day. Put it that way. Um, so another case. 
I was dispatched to a family fight, uh, domestic violence kind of a thing. Uh, and some people that I, I knew, uh, and I found one of them leaving. Uh, he had a giant welt under his eye, big, big, thick, swollen bruise under his eye. Uh, I knew him from uh, repeated reports about him being abusive in the relationship that he was in at the place that I was going to and uh, other relationships in the past and other apartments that I'd gone to with other women. We detained him. We went to the house and got a story from the other half who said that um, she hit him, that he had demanded something from her that she wasn't willing to give, that he had been incredibly abusive in the past and that she'd always lied to us, which tracked very well with our experience that he had cowed her into a corner and that she'd eventually lashed out at him to defend herself. And so the guy with the physical injury is the person that I arrested here. Uh, because of the things that I knew about their relationship in the past and because of uh, who could reasonably be, be seen based on gender and strength and size, who could be determined to be uh, afraid of another person, who could reasonably uh, have seen force used by the other person as dangerous to them, that's one of the things we made our determination on. So to go back to the factors that I listed before, uh, we had some things involved here. We had some, we had the size, strength, uh, disparity, uh, male versus female, uh, and a history here that would just lead to a reasonable person looking at the situation and say, no, she was absolutely defending herself. It was a hundred percent in the right. Uh, kind of wish she had gotten some help with the situation earlier on and hadn't lied to me so many times about it. But again, situations play out as they're going to play out. I can't make good decisions for people. I'm hoping. Yeah. So I was going to say, so in this, in this particular situation, even though uh, she was quote, the aggressor in terms of she admitted she did physically hit him. Mm -hmm. um, it was determined that, because of these other factors, she did reasonably fear that she was going to be in an altercation. And that's why it was deemed that he was the one that was arrested. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Um, it should be noted, I guess, that in Vermont, where I work, um, assault can also be through putting someone in fear for their safety through physical men menace. That's uh, mm. part of the simple assault statute. It can be part of the aggravated assault. Uh, an aggravated assault as well, depending on the situation. Um, I feel like those are um, good examples. And I don't, I mean, we can go back through my yeah. case history if you want to, but uh, I, don't, I don't, I don't know if, I don't know how much time we have really just to, to go. We, we've, we've, we've got some more time, not, not a ton, but what I like about those two examples is that they're really murky. They're not cut and dry. They're not the scenario that we talk about within martial arts circles of I was on the street minding my own business and <laughs> someone comes up to me and demands my wallet. And people might be listening and saying, well, you know, Jeremy, how how much does does what Sergeant Hamilton is talking about relate to martial arts? Um, if you're a martial arts instructor and you've been teaching more than a few years, I would statistically guarantee that you, well, no, maybe not guarantee. I would all but guarantee that you've had women who have been in abusive relationships in your class. If you've been teaching a little bit longer than that, or maybe even the same amount of time, I don't know the, the data points, but you've probably had some children who have been abused. 
this, this abuse as an initiate initiating circumstance for self-defense is a really broad and relevant aspect and it's one that we don't talk about because it's murky and it requires painting with some shades of gray and as instructors when we talk about self-defense we don't like to talk about shades of gray because it can vary um you know th there's there's burden of responsibility in telling people you know you brought it up if this then that you know that it's not that cut and dry do you have any cases with let's say the more cliche example of person minding their own business in let's say a public space a, a bar or walking down the street and someone comes out of nowhere is, is there one of those that we can unpack um yeah i mean there's one that immediately comes to mind um and uh frankly in retrospect i'm not entirely sure that i did the right thing in that um oh interesting uh so it's a little bit of a, a harder one to, to get exactly right, maybe because uh, it was hard enough that at the time, I don't know that we did. Um, but this is a good example of the 2020 hindsight thing. So uh, yeah, just a call of two people physically fighting on a sidewalk, uh, seemingly for no reason. Um, get there. They're literally still physically fighting. We're pulling people apart, restraining folks. Someone's bleeding from scrapes on the pavement. Um, it's a woman uh, and a, a, a sort of a larger square kind of uh, athletic strong woman uh, and a skinny willowy guy who is hammered, hammered, hammered drunk. Like totally obviously slurring his words doesn't make any sense. Talks in confused circles over and over and over again. Um, reeks of alcohol and someone that I, I just know from prior experience to have, um, to walk this way and to usually go to the bar and get himself smoking and drunk and uh, walk home. Um, he, despite being kind of willowy and hammered is uh significantly more of a threat to her oh there's another there's another guy involved uh just a, a passerby maybe like a late night jogger kind of an older fella um yeah. he's like well um i i came across the two of them and they were starting to fight and she was she seemed like she was trying to defend herself. And so I just jumped in and, and helped get the guy on the ground. And uh, someone called, and that's when you showed up. So we ended up arresting the drunk fella. And um, it's sort of hard to know exactly what was going on here. This is definitely not a give me your wallet sort of situation. Um, we talk to her, uh, she tells us that he's sort of drunk and spinning out of control and that, you know, she was trying to help him and help him home because he wasn't walking very well and it just escalated into a fight. Um, and that's when, that's when the older fella stumbled upon this, jumped in to try to help her to keep her from being injured. Um, she, I didn't know or didn't remember at the time, um, that this is a person that I knew and knew to have fairly significant mental health challenges. Um, so, I mean, there's some clues there, right? You, you're following drunk guy home from the bar intent on helping him. This is a situation where you're you're asking to be in some sort of trouble or some sort of physical confrontation. That's not your friend. You don't know them. Like, what do we, it's not, not what a normal person is going to do in this situation. Let the, the drunk guy who's maybe doesn't want to talk to you go home on his own. 
you can go home peacefully and safely. Um, and I think the mental health uh, issues sort of played into her um, sort of following and pestering this guy and the two of them eventually getting into it with one another and not really understanding each other or understanding where each other was coming from. Um, but on, I mean, and that's some 2020 hindsight as we were talking about before, but at the time on scene, we're talking about, I don't know, this kind of innocent woman trying to help this guy home and he's drunk and out of control and sort of eventually spun out. Um, I don't think, it, it, it's not a particularly serious case of violence. We um, charged him with disorderly conduct, which is kind of like, you know, step down, you were sort of violent, tumultuous in a public place, and it was uh, scary and potentially threatening and dangerous, but maybe you didn't actually assault someone, you didn't hurt somebody, ca cause any injury or anything like that. Again, not our typical, not, it's, none of these things, or not many of them anyway, have I come across that are sort of where you where you usually find yourself training in the martial arts dojo. Um, Fortunately. Yeah. I mean, we usually are walking through the being bullied scenario. We're walking through the being robbed scenario. We are walking through the being kidnapped, someone trying to rape us, uh, being uh, targeted essentially by someone we don't know. The reality is when faced with things, most violent situations are people we know. Uh, a lot of it comes up in the drug trade. It's where a lot of our violence comes from. And uh, when it isn't those things, it usually has something to do with um, mental health issues and sometimes drunk people, but mental health issues a, a lot. So the combination too can be extremely volatile. G given all the, the stuff that we've talked about and how, again, I'm going to come back to the word murky, multifaceted is probably another good word. Mm -hmm. What advice might you have? You know, we're, we're knocking on an, hour, on an hour here and, you know, it's okay if we go over, but mm -hmm. I want I want to give people some, some, I mean, actionable information isn't the right word, but some some takeaways, and I know that there's a lot of nuance, that things are going to vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But given what you've seen, given that you have a context for violence, that fortunately, the vast majority of the population will never have. And knowing that you're speaking to martial artists, people who, if they're still listening at this point in the episode, they're interested in this subject. What advice as a martial artist who is able to to and and responsible for see violence from an authoritarian authoritative perspective what would you tell them uh stay out of scenarios where you th where violence is likely to occur um <laughs> yeah i mean and I'm, I'm, i think i'm talking to an audience of people that are probably generally doing a good job of that but um we can all kind of look around our world and, and know where violence is likely to occur. I think uh, understanding the, the dynamics of violence, which I can go over just a little bit of uh, here, uh, also a good idea, but just keeping yourself out of those situations is sort of the first thing. The reality is that for um, normal citizens uh, encountering violence, outside of personal relationships can be incredibly rare. Um, and if we do things uh, appropriately to keep ourselves out of situations that sometimes turn violent, um, we've done, we are at far greater risk from things like heart attack and cancer than we are from suddenly being accosted and robbed on the street. Um, so violence, violence dynamics. Uh, there's a great book. I actually have it sitting right here. Um, this is one I would recommend for folks facing violence by Rory Miller. Um, 
he goes over some of the the dynamics of violence, divides them up essentially into two categories. The first very common category is social violence, and the less common category is asocial violence. Um, social violence is the well, it basically breaks down into four categories. The monkey dance, sort of the dominance contest. I'm the bigger monkey. No, I'm the bigger monkey. No, I'm the bigger monkey. Um, you can definitely see the, uh, there's almost, I mean, he calls it a monkey dance because there are, there are almost guaranteed steps for it with the chest puffed out and the squaring off and the sort of tit for tat word exchange eventually evolves into like a reaching pointing you know the finger in the chest or the finger in the face thing uh and then a big looping stupid totally monkey brained I, i'm not thinking up here i'm thinking kind of back here overhand punch like it's it's almost clockwork the way uh, the way those things go. Um, for martial artists, you just don't have to participate in that stuff. Like, get up and leave. You're not, you do not have to dance this dance with anybody. It's totally a choice. So, up and leave. I feel like I've said that before. Yeah. Uh, a lot. Of times. Yeah. Uh, there's a group monkey dance, which is sort of the same thing, but often involves some sort of uh, territory or resource. Um, there's a lot of that sort of stuff that goes into larger scale violence. Um, not super, super important. Don't be, if you don't want to be in other kinds of monkey dances, hey, don't, don't, don't join a gang. It's just not, that's, that's, that's not going to help you avoid Good. violence. Don't join a gang. That's good advice. Yep. Um, uh, there is also the educational beatdown in some uh, some facets of our society. Still, uh, some subcultures. Um, sometimes we are we are learned things by being violenced upon because we are violating some kind of unwritten social code, and so. Uh, folks will experience violence as a way to correct their behavior. Um, so the way to avoid that is to not be around folks that think that violence is a good way to teach folks things. Uh, also to know if you are in one of those situations and try to understand when social norms in those situations might be being violated and don't do that. Um, <laughs> There's no need to, even, even if you find yourself caught in one of these situations, there's no need to be, uh, you know, apologies work. They usually go everywhere. Uh, if you are someplace where you, you speak the language, um, just about everyone will take, oh, hey, I didn't know that was wrong. Hey, I'm sorry. Uh, as long as we are honest and honest enough and uh have our ego in check enough that we are able to apologize for offending somebody. I think we're good in that. Uh, the last is the status seeking show. And this is, this is the only one uh, outside of predators that I would say your careful person can still kind of run afoul of. And this is the non alpha, non dominant, uh, member of a group in which violence is sort of an acceptable part of life, um, trying to raise their perceived status within a group by beating up someone who's not part of the things. Sounds like a bully. Sounds like a, a gener generic description of bullying. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, sort of pack hierarchy stuff. Uh, if I pick someone to pick on that seems kind of tough, and I do a good job of it. Other people will see me as tougher and I will move up in status. Uh, again, we can avoid situations uh, where folks think that violence is a way to show their status um, and avoid places where um, those folks congregate. Don't be involved in them and don't go to where they are. Like, I just don't need to be around any of that stuff. 
Um, okay. So the other, that's that's half of violence. It's a lot more than half of violence, but it's sort of half of our, our split of the general dynamics of violence. So the other half is the asocial violence. Um, resource predators and process predators, so kind of the predator types. Um, resource predators are uh, after something that you have that they want. Um, so, it, I mean, it's it's money. It's usually money. This is the uh, this is the robber. Uh, when I say robber, I do not mean thief. I mean robber. Robber meaning that you are assaulting somebody or assaulting someone through intimidation in order to get a resource off of them. Um, this is becoming less and less common as it becomes harder and harder to get done, but uh, it's it's still present. And then there's, so beyond that, that resource predator, there's also the process predator. And this is the like truly scary serial killer -y stuff, which we know exists and is incredibly rare and also incredibly, incredibly, incredibly scary. Um, they have, uh, with predators, the two strategies we see with them are charm and blitz. So um, the blitz is, you don't see it, you don't know it, there's no forewarning, there isn't like, hey, you just, just all on, all out, immediate. They don't, predators don't, aren't looking for violence. They're looking for getting either through their process or getting their resource. So the more that they can maneuver the situation into a situation where you're not gonna fight back at all, uh, that's what they're going to do. These, these are folks that are Makes sense. looking to inflict violence potentially uh, or use violence to get the to get the resource that they want. They do not want resistance. This is not social. This is not for status. They don't need to be seen doing this. Um, this is to victimize somebody. So um, some will try to charm folks into a situation where they can't fight back. Some will just wait and watch and then blitz when they feel like the situation is advantageous. Um, so knowing, knowing those things, um, reading, there's a lot more detail about that stuff in the book. I think he does a very good job of parsing out, um, uh, all of those, uh, different types of violence and what to look for and how to avoid them. Uh, what, what, how various kinds of responses, uh, can be useful both physical and non-physical. Uh, so I recommend the book for our folks. Again, Facing Violence by Rory Miller. We didn't uh, go over a couple of the legal things, but I think we're kind of winding down here time-wise. Yeah. Yeah, if, if we, if you get to a good point where, I mean, again, you know, we may bring you back for a part two, mm -hmm. um, you know, especially if folks have questions, but, you know, I'll, I'll let you look for, for a good place for us to wind down here. Oh, yeah, no. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, I guess, so... I don't really want to go too far down in, into this. Um, I guess the last thing I'll leave you guys with is, uh, you guys touched on this, um, you both touched on it separately in your previous podcast, that um, we are fighting, when you're, we're defending ourselves, when the police are trying to overcome resistance to whatever it is we're doing, we're not fighting bodies. People make this mechanical distinction that uh, you do this to them, you do that to them. You do... All of these things, until or unless you kill somebody, all of these things are just convincing the other person 
that it is no longer useful to them to either be violent towards you or to resist what you're what you're trying to do. The cases outside of killing, the cases of police completely physically incapacitating someone, like breaking all their arms and making them totally incapable of resisting, are vanishingly small, zero, essentially. But we are not fighting minds, we are fighting bodies. We're convincing folks that it is no longer worth it. Um, when that point is, is, is going to vary depending on circumstance and it does once again, not really lend itself to mechanical distinction. Uh, you know, maybe a pain in the leg to this person is enough and that we're going to have to just remember in general, eventually this person is, in order to be overcome, we're going to have to convince them. We're gonna to have to overcome their mind, their willingness to be resistant or their willingness to try to hurt, hurt us. But it's going to be here. They're going to make a decision at some point. Hey, this just isn't worth it. Um, and the one thing, the, the thing that I, I really like telling martial artists about violence, partially because the cases are so murky, partially just because of, uh, because our, our dojo environments uh, can be so sterile, is that we're not, when we're actually talking about physical violence, we are not talking about sparring. We're not talking about boxing. We're not talking about MMA. All of these things are the contests of skill, strength, speed, endurance, and tac tactics. A real fight is a survival contest. The stakes are far too high for rules and fair play. I can guarantee you, you will not be attacked by someone who thinks it's going to be a fair fight. People are not here mm -hmm. for the challenge. Good point. They are here because they think that they can win and because they get something out of winning. And they haven't chosen into this because they think you're going to beat them or because this would be an interesting contest. So for cops, I always say, hey, it's, it's just, uh, so work-related hazard. Violence is a work-related hazard. We are under no obligation to prove our manhood, beat our chests. We are just looking to accomplish our legal goal goals and go home safely for a normal person trying to defend themselves, you're just looking to go home safely. And the only good kind of kill is overkill. That means presenting with more force than the other person is willing to stand up to. Right on. All right. Sounds like a good place to end. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, so, well said. If we want to get into other uh, sort of legal stuff, I uh, I dug up uh, some jury instructions for uh, self defense arguments in uh, oh, a couple of our surrounding states here, and um, we can go over some of the court cases and that sort of stuff. Uh, but maybe at another time. Sounds great. I, I appreciate you being here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. Sergeant Hamilton, I also want to thank you for for coming on the show. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to have a, have a good chat with us. Uh, always happy to talk about this stuff. This stuff is uh, it's my my uh, stock and trade, so to speak. I had an absolute blast with this conversation. I learned a ton, and I'm glad to know that my instincts, our instincts, were more or less spot on. Always makes me feel good to not get stuff wrong, but I really appreciated how much deeper we were able to go and the specific examples and just the further understanding I had. This is one of the things that we work hard to bring you on this show is educational, entertaining, and connective content. So thank you to Sergeant Hamilton for coming on. Thanks for your time. And thank you to Andrew for that connection. Thanks to both of you for making this such a great show. Thank you to you, the listener, for giving us a reason to do this show and all the other things that we do. If you want to show your support, 
Remember, Patreon, go to whistlekick.com, whistlekickmarshalartsradio.com, share stuff, tell people, leave reviews, buy things, you know, lots of options. Check it out, do it. Thank you. We appreciate you. If you've got feedback or guest suggestions or topic suggestions, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com, and our social media is at whistlekick everywhere. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 